Warm greetings and good evening from the Chennai Center for China Studies. Today we are virtually here for a book conversation on the book China Inc. Between State Capitalism and Economic Statecraft with its author, Dr. Arvind Elleri. At the outset, congratulations for this book, which is extremely relevant and timely. Our today's author needs no introduction. Dr. Arvind Elleri is a senior research fellow at the HSBC Business School, Peking University, Beijing. He is involved in teaching and curating courses for PKU and select universities globally and at a few Indian institutes of management in India. In 2019, he won the Best Courseware Project Funds Award at Peking University. Dr. Ellery is also a visiting faculty at the Fudan School of Management, Shanghai. Prior to joining PKU, he was associate fellow and assistant director at the Institute of Chinese Studies, Delhi, India. He holds a PhD in Chinese studies with particular interest in political economy. And he has co-edited a book titled Tailspin, The Politics of India-China Economic Relations, which was released in 2020. And recently, his recent book is China INC between state capitalism and economic statecraft. Thank you, sir, for taking time out to be with us today. With these words, I would like to hand over to my Director General Commodore R.S. Vasan for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bala. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a special welcome to Dr. Arvind, who we've known for years now. And uh, we've always been very, very grateful to him for accepting our invitation. And this was one such opportunity where, uh, you know, we were in touch with each other. And uh, then that uh, book, you know, which, has been, which had been published uh, became an issue for discussion. And uh, he readily agreed to send us the copies. And uh, Kamado Vijesh Garg, actually, the whole show will be today between Kamado Vijesh Garg, who is the executive director of C3S, and Dr. Arvind Deleri, because uh, Vijesh put his heart and soul into it to read. And now he can write a book. Uh, you know, just as <laughs> Dr. Uh, uh, Deleri has written. Dr. Deleri has uh, come, come for many of our programs, and uh, you know, he has enriched our uh, discussions. Uh, in each on each occasion that he's been with us. So I'm grateful to you, Dr. Arvind, for having come here. And uh, as far as Chennai Center for China Studies itself is concerned, uh, we completed 13 years. And it's been a wonderful journey. And I'm also happy to uh, acknowledge the contribution by Asma, who is with us today. So, uh, you know, it's a small team, but we are supported by a large number of members. You know, that is our strength. The members who come from uh, diverse uh, streams, you no know, IFS, IAS, scientists, uh, businessmen, academicians. No, so this is the kind of support that we get, and all this comes pro bono. You know, not many think tanks can uh, claim that uh, you know everything comes uh, with this kind of voluntary uh, support. So whether it is monetary support, whether it is moral support, whether it is intellectual support, we are blessed to have uh, you know members who are here. Many of them are here today. You know, Mr. L. V. Krishnan, Sridharan Subramanian, Colonel Hariharan. Uh, patron, of course, who is not here today. But so that is the kind of uh, support that this think tank uh, gets from uh, all our members and our well wishers. Uh, we launched two uh, major initiatives uh, under this new team that we have, new and dynamic team of Bala, Nisha, Padma Shri. And uh, China Watch is being very well received today around the world. You know, that's something which comes out every fortnight and it puts everything together, it makes your job easier for looking up to references which are there. So, and also the fact that uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the young interns uh, make it a point to look up to C3S. You know, we have, have interns from all over. And then the numbers uh, uh, would astonish you uh, if I tell you that more than 76 interns have already completed their internship with us, uh, you know, during this pandemic. So, which is a great record by any standard. And so I am sure that uh, we'll continue to you know, meet the demands of uh, trying to understand China better. So what we are trying to do today is such an effort to try and look at the economic vertical. You know, we do have an economic vertical within the China Center for China Studies, along with the, the geopolitic vertical, the, the, the cultural vertical, the economic vertical, and the science and technology vertical. So, you know, these are the verticals in which we are trying to bring in quality discussions that will uh, enrich the, the knowledge of uh, China. So from that point of view, what we are trying to do today is to look at uh, China Incorporated. So this is the book, China INC, you want to call it whatever you want to. The point is that uh, China has this habit 
of thinking out of the box let's acknowledge and give the devil its due you know obviously they have been able to build up this kind of a reserve you know everybody spoke about the 3.3 plus trillion dollars of reserve that we have when you have this kind of a reserve with you it becomes easy for you to experiment explore innovate and even be adventurous at times so which is what has been the the refrain of of the policy makers in china so there is mao other which is uh, xi jinping now so they've been definitely looking beyond the conventional wisdom of how economics is to be managed whether it's macroeconomics or microeconomics you know after of course this is after dr irvindalari wrote the book that suddenly people are now looking at common prosperity so again you look at look at the kind of disruptions that are going to be put in this is the disruptive kind of uh, working that is there and in my assessment it is thanks to the buffer that they have thanks to the reserves that they have thanks to the fact that they captured global markets thanks to the fact that they are at the center of the global supply chain that they are able to you know look beyond uh, normal conventional wisdom and engage in uh, you know uh, issues that that will uh, bring about changes and all this is not happening uh, you know just 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 on the spur of the moment everything has been thought out so if they have set targets of 2025 if they set targets of 2039 and 2049 so this is what they would like to achieve if they say that we would like to bring about a prosperous society a moderately prosperous society and we would like to make china number 1 this is what they are working to so that means once a statement is made by the the leader for life who has been anointed so then every the complete mechanism works like in a democracy uh, there there's a, once the xi jinping says something that is the veda vakyam as we say and everybody gets on with trying to get that uh, done so this is where uh, what we are going to discuss today will be of great relevance as to how china has invested so much in in even the intellectual exercise of of trying to bring about greater economic revival you know of course it's been at a considerable cost and everybody said that the cultural revolution is a great one not realizing that there were millions who died for for different different reasons so this also should be borne in our uh, mind but uh, in uh, my assessment it's entirely because of the fact that uh, they are able to uh, use this buffer uh, to experiment you no know, they can absorb some losses even bri they are quite willing to uh, absorb these losses as they go from asia to africa to europe uh, in different uh, countries because that gives them a strategic foothold so they also are quite clear that once the trade moves in somewhere it is the flag that follows we all have seen what's happening in sri lanka today and that's entirely related to the fact that they became totally dependent on chinese investments and today they have declared a food crisis a food emergency in the capital so the smaller neighbors you know initially it appears very lucrative for them to look at this money and then when they go and engage with them the terms are such that china would like to you know get everything that it is invested there and much more but today's topic is not about bri though uh, the final two chapters are also devoted to apparently to discussions on bri and how this investment is helping them not only economically by uh, market expansion but also in terms of ensuring that they challenge usa in all spheres so you look at militarily you find china has overtaken uh, the, the us navy in terms of their numbers sheer numbers you look at them economically they are on a trajectory while every other economy suffered during covid they have gone ahead you look at the geopolitics now they are the most relevant force in afghanistan after the withdrawal of uh, usa from afghanistan so you see that there is a a method in the madness if you want to call it that and there is a, a well orchestrated uh, uh, you know agenda that that is working and it's easy there obviously because of the system that they have so i will not take too much of time because it is entirely a show of kamoda vijesh garg and dr arvind alleri uh, today uh, i don't claim to have read the book i read glimpses of this so i would rather be a patient listener here today and I'll let kamoda uh, vijesh garg handle the whole issue over to you uh, vijesh all yours i am muted vijesh welcome dr arvind <clears throat> yep after the opening statement of the director general i will only say that this is a very new thinking when i read this book 
I wrote this book at the right time when CCP has just completed 100 years. So it is nice to read and know by the people this 100 years of growth of China is not so easy how they're gone. It's nice to see a competitor, maybe a rival, maybe a, your maybe an enemy. If something good has happened, nothing wrong in learning from them. I look at that way. So this book is very, very important to see from that point of view, which you have written very beautifully, that what China has done, how they have done, how can we take and take this journey? Can we take better than them? Can we emulate them? And can we follow it in our way? So with this, I hand over to you, Dr. Nerili. Joshua. So first of all, thank you uh, C3S for uh, hosting this event. And I must uh, start thanking uh, Commodore Vasan. Uh, Vasan sir has been always uh, so supportive and accommodative uh, to new, new, new people, new talent and new researchers. And I believe that I'm still a researcher. So I always look at him, you know, for some guidance and then the platform of C3S to interact with a uh, world set of new researcher and new prospectors, which you do not get on other platforms. Uh, so thank you for the event. Thank you for, uh, uh, you know, making it possible, giving a calendar date, and then we are discussing it today. And uh, thank you, Commodore Gart, for uh, uh, your uh, initial encouragement. I look forward to the comments by you. And also, I think uh, uh, Bala will be making some comments. So I think uh, I, I, rather than I discussing what the book is all about and making it, you know, uh, a launch or a propaganda about the book or a marketing affair all over here, I will just briefly in about 10 to 15 minutes present the idea, you know, which uh, which made writing the book possible. And uh, as a result of it, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to everyone who, who helped me uh, in the process of writing the book, to all my, uh, the team in China, the team in India, and all my teachers and uh, the bad wishers. Now to start with, uh, I mean, did I fix 2021 as a timeline to bring out the book? Uh, no, that is that was not on my mind. I did not decide that it will come in 2021 when CCP uh, will, be, will be, you know, commemorating the 100th uh, anniversary. Our, uh, China will be, you know, uh, celebrating the accomplishment of the first centenary, you know, uh, with regard to the poverty elevation. Uh, the, 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 the projects, were, the project went on for about one and a half years. Uh, the, a lot of the project started after I uh, joined formally with uh, Peking University. Uh, over the period of time in last 20 years, since I was a student of China studies, uh, I started learning uh, doing uh, a lot of ground studies on China, on, on and above, I felt that the Chinese literature, the literature on China in India is often influenced by the non-Indian academia. Uh, there are few bright uh, literature and books written by the Indian academia on Chinese also, but uh, largely uh, the literature is influenced by the non-Indian academia. Um, and then even that, uh, the subject is so huge, uh, whether that is from political aspects, economic aspects, political economic aspects, or uh, civilizational cultural aspects. Uh, the literature which is available, which we have, uh, has many limitations. And I think that was the instigating point. And I think that was one point I thought, uh, why not just put down uh, all these things in a, in a, in a strict wireframe. Now, uh, the background of the book, uh, concept of the book is such that whenever any mature or any researcher who picks up a book on China, we often read and look at China from a fixated mind, so binaries, okay? I mean, uh, well, uh, Mao founded it or CPC founded it, it's one party uh, or it's, it's the uh, you know, Communist Party which is running it, then we come across various terms, you know, socialist capitalism, market uh, socialism, so on and so forth. And then we try to relate China with the non-Chinese experiences of its growth or its you know, political processes. And it happens so that you know, we develop unconsciously uh, uh, a binary, 
to understand China. And those binaries limit uh, our studies. Those binaries eventually create biases to look at China. And I think that is a major uh, uh, challenge for those who want to take up Chinese studies. And somewhere I wanted to address this problem of you know, binaries uh, and, and, and address the question the way we have adopted the binaries, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, the, the way it suits the writer or the researchers. You know, we have used these binaries often, uh, uh, you know, uh, explicitly to describe China. We have used it as a as a switch on and off. Uh, it's winning or losing. It's collapsing or rising. Uh, so, you know, we have been using uh, China. We have been deciding on various matters with regard to China through the perspective of oxymorons. And maybe uh, partly, I'm not saying it is a result of uh, uh, poor research in China. I'm saying it is merely a uh, result of uh, China not letting other researchers get an access to, or maybe we, we are doing researchers maybe largely under the influence of non-China uh, academia or non-Indian academia. So this book is somewhere, you know, trying to bridge those important uh, gaps and try to address uh, uh, those functional, uh, you know, uh, functional void and try to fill that uh, void, you know, uh, in some or the other way. And this is an, a small effort to, 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 uh, to discuss about it. As I said, you know, uh, there are two terms uh, which the book talks about is a state capitalism and uh, economic statecraft. Now, state, cap state capitalism is not a new concept for China. State capitalism was, uh, I mean, in various key speeches, Mao kept on uh, saying, you know, how China, new China is going to embrace the state capitalism. His, his speech in uh, July 9th, 1943, 1953, he talks about, you know, how the, how China is, you know, uh, is a new capitalist economy and is more practical and how it is, you know, uh, one which is helping the people's government of China to, to run the socialist economy more efficiently and taking out, uh, you know, or bringing out uh, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, reform processes. 1951 and 53, I'm not discussing a lot about it in another 10 seconds only, uh, was also an initial period when Mao was experimenting in the Chinese economy. And this comes in the first and second book when I'm talking about, you know, how China uh, 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 reformed itself, you know, how it made itself, you know, uh, um, uh, stronger uh, and more, uh, you know, uh, innovative, the way it, it reformed itself. You know, it did not reform the way East European uh, countries, you know, embraced reforms and opening up. So it, it was a different. So the, the point I'm trying to make it, state capitalism was not something new, state capitalism, was uh, was discussed. So the Chinese, for Chinese reformers, for Chinese leaders, uh, discussing state capitalism or you know uh, uh, taking different measures, uh, reform measures, uh, structural changes in the name of state capitalism, was not uh, something uh, different. Was not something uh, uh, unique about it. So state capitalism did exist over there. I mean, did was was practiced. Now the point. What I'm trying to make in the book is that despite having a political structure where the, uh, where the party is, is uh, controlling the core of policy making and is running the processes or deciding the way the state should behave uh, uh, you know, economically and then externally also, uh, you would see that the state capitalism in China, in communist China, was, is different is different than what we see in the young democracies uh, where, you know, we, we are growingly seeing that, you know, uh, there is a lot of power being concentrated in the hands of few leaders. The Chinese experience of state capitalism is different uh, than the so-called uh, uh, democratic state capitalists, Brazil, India, and Indonesia. Uh, the Chinese state capitalism is different again from the democratic countries like Thailand, Turkey, and Malaysia. Okay, uh, uh, and it is even different from 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 um, you know I can I cannot say it, but you know uh, uh, Russia's state capitalist uh, model. So despite China's current economic downturn, 
you know, the, the overall economic success of China's authoritarian state uh, lies somewhere in the balancing act what China is doing and trying to find alternatives. Now, this process to balance and to find alternatives has been, uh, has been uh, experiencing uh, a lot of iconic decision makings, which essentially puts, you know, uh, 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 party in the pressure, uh, institutions under pressure, uh, the structures have been, you know, revisited. They are also facing, uh, you know, uh, a task to balance uh, between, you know, uh, these two, 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 uh, two, two extremes. When we say about economic statecraft, economic statecraft, as we know, you know, it is all about, you know, uh, the correlations between the domestic and international policies, you know, how China has been managing all about it. So now, when I started looking at this broader concept, and decided whether or not I can come out with a substantial amount of uh, uh, qualitative uh, research as well as the quantitative uh, you know, outputs or deliverables. Uh, it became so that I started realizing that uh, state capitalism and economic statecraft has been uh, has been somewhere balanced, has been uh, managed by the party so that the state would progress. But at the same time, uh, there are various cycles uh, internally, domestically, which influence the Chinese state capital or Chinese economic statecraft. And it was essential to bring those inertia or those internal dynamics more forcefully in the book to, to differentiate what are the variables of the Chinese state capitalism, and uh, what are those challenges which uh, may uh, influence the Chinese economic growth? Because essentially, the book is not talking about how China has beautifully grown or how China has robustly kept its growth momentum. The book essentially talks about what are those uh, the variables you know which have created problems, but the statecraft have managed to curate them, but also there are many challenges which are upcoming. So the book under uh, the first part of uh, the conceptual frameworking of state capitalism then finds out uh, various challenges the state capitalism in China uh, is undergoing. And, and, and to do that, uh, it takes state and enterprises as one of the case. Uh, so state and enterprises becomes quite, uh, you know, methodologically, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 viable uh, uh, topic or viable tool, uh, which can be used to see how the economics, uh, how the state, how the state capitalism has been influenced, or how the state capitalism is influencing this uh, role of state enterprises. On the other side, the state enterprises has been influencing the China's economic statecraft externally. So the SOEs come into the picture as one of the two. Uh, a methodological tool to explain the correlations or maybe the contradictions or the challenges which the state capitalism and economic state craft faces and then the way the Chinese economic China Inc you know is 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 trying to overcome the challenges while I take SOEs as one of the important tool then it was important and also practical to find out which are the other variables I would associate with the SOE's restructuring or SOE's performances, which would contribute in assessing the performance of state capitalism and economic statecraft. And then it finds out, I mean, if you uh, get a chance to look at the book, the first few chapters talks about uh, how the Chinese have adapted, how the Chinese state capitalism adapted to changes and how it, you know, overcome the, over, overcome the challenges. In the second half, uh, those challenges have been have been uh, uh, have been uh, discussed more thoroughly with the examples, tools, I and mean, methodology of using SOEs and the various associated variables. For example, privatization. Uh, that's one uh, variable. Second variable was inter or intra SOE uh, competition, uh, or maybe public-private partnerships. So these variables were used 
keeping state enterprises you know, role or the performance or the restructuring at the center and then question or challenge the Chinese state capitalism. I mean, how, much, how far it has done better or how worst it has done and what would be the performance scale uh, going forward, you know, I, I, I did not try to be prophetic over here, but you know, some actual uh, deliberations have been made in the book. Secondly, uh, you have seen about the Chinese economic statecraft from 1978. Um, the Chinese uh, economic growth has taken over everyone uh, by surprise. And uh, the way the Chinese engagement with the international world had changed significantly. It's, it's, it's responses to international events, it's, it's, it's reactions, it's associations with international crisis, um, it's participation in international institutions, political and financial institutions has been something, you know, worth, you know, um, uh, studying, you know, in, at, at, in, in deeper, uh, at deeper length. So the economic statecraft of Chinese has been always an example and always a model for those who wanted to study China, those who want to study China, follow China and understand China better. And essentially after uh, Xi Jinping taking over with our 13 onwards launch of BRI, uh, it became quite, uh, uh, you know, pertinent to, to understand that what is the state capitalism uh, uh, economic statecraft China talks about. It, does it have any correlations with the state capitalism? Uh, maybe uh, uh, what are the, uh, you know, the, the future directions of e economic statecraft? Uh, in the end, as Commander Watson said, you know, uh, while I describe both these uh, uh, important uh, notions, state capitalism and, and economic statecraft throughout all the nine chapters, the economic statecraft discussion regarding economic statecraft comes out more forcefully in the in the in the subsequent in the last few chapters, and there you would find that the economic statecraft which China talks about uh, reached a peak uh, during BRI, and but slowly uh, somewhere it plateaued, and uh, now the time is actually the statecraft is swing, uh, is is experiencing something you know uh, uh, you know uh, slowing down. And that's where now the Chinese are putting you know, more efforts, more concentration to, to shape uh, the economic uh, statecraft, you know, how, how, what China is. You, you hear about the shared prosperity, you hear about uh, uh, harmonious China, you hear about a lot of such beautiful words and phrases which China keeps talking about every day. So that is the result, you know, why, why China wants to tell everyone that uh, State capitalism has been success. Chinese model of uh, economic reforms has been success. Chinese growth, Chinese trade with its neighbors has been one of the model which models which everyone should follow. And there exists, you know, a bright future for everyone. So book book talks about all these things, keeping in mind that there are many contradictions in this Chinese version or the Chinese evolution of state capitalism and economic statecraft. There are a lot of times the books keep talking about how the wealth creation was revisited, how the wealth creation has taken over by, by the state agencies or by the state institutions, how the private privatizations has been taken over seriously by the, uh, by the, by the, uh, by the Chinese state, Chinese party, how the PPP models have a major problems. It is not the ideal Western uh, non-Chinese concept of PPP. There are a lot of flaws in, in, in the PPP models of, models of China. Um, then how these provinces are competing with each other. Usually uh, those books which talks about uh, China's rise or China's economic reforms really do not uh, get enough uh, time, resources, and space to put into the other, put in the other aspects of Chinese reforms or Chinese uh, success, uh, economic successes, uh, because of the paucity of researchers and other things. I, I do not say that you know they do lack this, but maybe because of the paucity of many things, they do not uh, include it. But this book has included a lot of such uh, contradictions. You know how the provinces struggle to come forth, how the provinces feel uneasy to cooperate with the central 
state -owned enterprises and how the central uh, central state -owned enterprises uh, bully or try to threaten the provincial enterprises and then the interaction the political interaction between the, between the provincial leadership and the central leadership try to balance it there are cases also the book talks about where the provincial enterprises has are bigger than the uh, 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 centrally owned soes economic performance or the subsidiaries provision. So this, uh, this balancing, uh, or maybe this tug of war, uh, is creating challenges for, 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 for the Chinese economy and the whole Chinese political economy. And it, it looks that in next 10 to 15 years, and in the book, I, I talk that the state capitalism has never been constant uh, in China. Uh, the interaction between the state capitalism and economic uh, statecraft have never been the same. It kept on changing. And the shortest cycle of that change was about three to five years. The longest cycle of that change was somewhere about 15 to 17 years. And these changes of cycles and interactions between the state capitalism and economic statecraft has uh, made China uh, what we see today. Uh, you know, uh, an example, uh, a topic, uh, a hot topic every researcher should visit and uh, uh, read about or uh, try to delve into uh, deeper discussions. And I think uh, that's where I stop. And uh, maybe I would like to hear uh, about uh, the discussions, you know, how they think, how they view the book and uh, or if it is balanced or something needed to be added here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I would like to call upon my executive director, Komodo Vijesh Kumarga, to present his thoughts on the book. Over to you, sir. Sir, could you please unmute yourself, sir? Thank you so much, Bala, for prompting me. Okay. First, why I read this book, Dr. Jerry? I read this book with lots of interest and I had a challenge in my house. They are reading a book. I was reading the book with so much patience. You can see the marks I put in the book. The aim of my reading this book was a lot of debate within India is going on about the PSUs. So I was trying to understand how China has gone, what can be done, are we going right or wrong. The, my aim of reading this book. So I learned a lot from this. Now for everybody, when you look at that, Dr. Jelleri said his aim was not to put, get the book out in 2021 when the Chinese uh, CCP is controlling I mean, 100 years and 72 years of their rule. But I just look at that way. That book has come at the right moment when everybody looking at CCP ruling uh, China for the last 72 years. And for Mao's time, when the economy was going down, and from 1978, when the Deng Xiaoping got the reforms, where China, they're not looked back. And he just mentioned just now that every three to five years, the changes are happening continuously. And that's what we have, they have reached where they have reached. So I read this book with this context. Now, this is a very classic example that he mentioned in his talk and the book also refers that why China succeeded in doing this to being a communist socialist ideology. They did not fail by doing the reforms. When there are others have failed, Europeans have failed, Russians have failed, they did not fail. So very nice example in the book he has given the regions, how they could, how which approach they took. That's the basics about the book. Okay. Now it's he mentioned in the book, and if you for our run in terms, when we define our research and we say if you take a problem and you define the problem, then you write your synopsis. This is a classic example. Dr. Arvind explains to us what he was studying, why he took SOE as one of the factors in the Chinese growth as and how they have done it, with how they come down to a focus problem, a focus point of study that how he has done. The book is concentrating on SOE, so-called state-owned enterprises, how China formed when Mao's time, economy had gone down badly because of ideology and political control. In 1978, when Deng took in charge and he brought the new idea how China should be. And it was an absolutely new idea in a communist thought process. He brought the reforms. He brought the reforms in the sense that 
we are doing in a very controlled way. And you know, China, the CCP, I'm not anti, today I'm not speaking anti-China. I've read this book as a rival who has gone ahead of us, how he has done what we yet to be done or we have not done so much. So you must read in a strategy, you must read your competitors, analyze your competitor, if he's ahead of you, why he's ahead of you, where is ahead of you, how he is ahead of you, that's how I write this book. So, what Deng did in 78, he saw that we have a Soviet which are running before that, the state capital was there always, communist system, control, CCP are controlling the whole PSUs, so-called SOEs. So efficiency was very down, it was more of a place of employment, the book mentioned somewhere, it was a place of employment, that was an approach like we had a PSU in our, our country. So efficiency was very poor. They were not adding to the growth. They were more of getting liabilities. When the Deng came with the idea of let's open, let's open up in the 1980s. And this idea came with the SOEs, which are the larger junk they had. No more people working there. So it started with the reforms there in, in these sectors. And it took the agriculture sector, industry sector, defense. R&D, 1978-80 thought of that. So look at the vision of a leader, how to change the future of a nation started 1978-80 and he put all the eyes on the SOU that they need the reforms in 1978-80. He put the reforms in their partnership system, in the administration, in the performance management, various body, I mean, body of, of who's monitoring them, who is assessing them, who's looking after the structuring. And this is what the major junk he put and it's never looked back since then. The Jamin came, then the, another Xi Jinping is there. None of them have reversed these reforms. It's only, as you mentioned in his talk, that every three to five year reforms are going on stage by stage. I come to what stage they have gone through. Now he says, open, open the economy, open the door of the economy. Is something about India in 1991. Open the economy because then only you can look outwards. Otherwise, you are a frog in the well, not looking outside. Then you know what can be done. Now, in these reforms, what happened in this growth because SOE was restructured. They are not 100% control of the political leaders. They went into a partnership. They went to the reforms of the reorganization, industrialization, open market. This was actually changed the whole culture of SOE in, in a nutshell. The book brings out beautifully. However, Communist Party of China, that's Kumaro Vassal talk in his English talk, they also had a position. 1989, when they had anti you know, democratic rights again, all this. Similarly, you have when they knew the reforms, the communist culture, socialist culture were against it because against the ideology of, politi of politics that you are going to private, you are opening to privatization. So it was against that, threatening the social system of China. But as he said, the dictatorship, one party, the no opposition, they crushed this nicely. We all know what happened in Tinman Square, Tinman Square some time back. So that we discussed some other uh, debate earlier. Now, he also said it this state capitalism of China differs from other countries, like Russia I just mentioned, because they are totally controlled by the communist socialist culture. When the Deng started doing his reforms, first was this part. People opposed it. He said, nothing doing, we'll go ahead. And all those measures were required to be taken. Like any change management, he applied those tools. And he continued, so not looking back that way. He also see in his book that how relationship of, of your SOEs, so-called state-owned enterprises, was with the Chinese political system. It also need a restructuring there. It was totally 100% controlled. It has to let out. That was another major factor which came to bring the efficiency. So called, they called Deng's long march, open door policy. This is what aimed to get the China global attraction. Let companies come invest with us. We learn from them partnership. But partnership varies from the FDI, we call it so called FDI. People came, joined China. China was nobody's game. Nobody was going to China. 
What's happening in China? Nobody knew about it. But now he opened doors, all the doors. People came there. He brought the reforms, not only SOE, SOE working with the agriculture sector also. You call household contract responsibility system and the change in the agriculture marketing, state production practices, something what we are looking at now in the farms laws. I'm just putting parallels continuously so you can understand better. Something but look at looking at, we are still looking at, they have done it. So you brought all these changes in the agriculture reforms, which also linked with SOE reforms as well. We, can, we are all are linked together. Actually, the sector which he identified himself was agriculture, manufacturing industry, science and technology, and defense, 1980s. So what Kumaram Boston mentioned at the beginning, look at a country, India, who's operating aircraft carrier for 1960s, though we're making aircraft carrier ourselves now. So far, we bought from abroad. China took a somebody's carrier, which is lying in, you know, in, in, in a junkyard, took it, understood, and made the carrier before us. That is what the strength has come to the SOEs. I'm taking the positive point from there and see where we can change ourselves. Similarly, in the urban reforms, he came up ideas of SEJ. We should have the specific community zone. So people will come, FDI will come, they will invest the money here. Initially, and but good political system of CCP, they are a partnership with us. So that what Dan said, I noted down somewhere. Yeah, this point was opening economy did not change or will not change China's political and social system. That was the bottom line. So when FDIs came, SCI were open, they all were there. All the technology which we wanted advancement was brought in in China. And then Chinese mastered the art. Now, why the difference of Chinese version of capitalism or so-called state capitalism is different than the other countries? What they say that the, the Europeans, when they wanted to reform, they went the big bomb, big bang theory or called the shock therapy system in management. What is that? That it says basically that you want to change your brain so that consumption is more, the demand is more, correct? But you recover also fast. There's a shock therapy system in the management. But then to the other system, which is slow approach, okay, for the gradual approach, that your demand will slowly go up, but recovery will also go slowly. So called, so called casual, not it's called a very cautious approach in management um, in parlance. That what then to slow, monitoring public response. Doing change, no accepting the opposition to change, but he continued with that theory in a mind. And East, why they fail? Why East Europeans fail? There were four factors. One was the economic decision making remained politicized in this, these countries. They could not take hard decisions. When you can't take hard decisions in change management, you will not succeed. Non competitive atmosphere, that's what Deng did in China. If you don't make your public sector where people are working competitive with the, with the private sector, they will remain inefficient. They will never grow up. And this is what happened in Russia, what happened in East Europe, but China did not happen that way. The change from them. Other factor is the domestic product being out to market competition. You are making something in your SOEs, domestic market, and there is something being made by FDIs here. You compete. If you don't compete in my market, why should I just substitute my item from you? This gives a chance from the SOEs to perform better. SOEs to improve their quality, their efficiency, because the competition is there. This is what lack in European countries. They failed in that. This was, and last was the conserving the efficient enterprises. That's what China did. All those who are doing good, like India, we have mini Ratnas, all those Ratnas. Some like that in China, all the way good, they were retained, supported by the government, much more. And in other countries, that was not followed. So the whole system collapsed. Yes, the, the leadership phase, very harsh criticism in China doing these reforms. But they say nothing called, is called, we will go for, the term you use in the book, for reforms promoting the meritocracy and competition. That was the Deng's idea, which continued with all the leaders came after him. Whether it was Jiang Jemin or it was Hu Jintao, nobody looked back. They continued in different, of course, ideology, different targets in their ten tenures. 
Now in China, when we look at the SOEs, they are giving a huge importance. In the constitution of China, in Article 7, he mentioned, they are the core institution of Chinese infrastructure. And they are allowed to take your scientific, economic, social welfare, ownership of the, because it's a communist socialist psychology or the ideology. They say is ownership of the people. Ownership remain with the people of country. That the whole concept they have followed. Now, all years, of course, they have areas are spread to energy, finance, infrastructure, IT, media. The best part is, I, the book has given lots of statistics that what uh, Dr. Jerry mentioned. A lot of statistics. He has got the quantity to prove the quality, basically. Qualitative analysis, the research, and tells you that by doing so, so-called state-owned enterprises, which we think PSU don't do better, this is the strength of China's economic growth. They made them so efficient, so performing. And in 2019 uh, list, 100, 119 means 119 of Chinese SOEs were listed in global Fortune 500 companies. That is what books brings out beautifully. That you start from a scratch, you are taking a stand, you bring the change, you bring the reforms, don't look back. Yes, mid correction, keep doing it, keep listening to people, adjusting them. And he, he used the word economic readjustment always. The Deng in his theory, in his statements, he got economic readjustment, always said that. And he promoted the private partnership. Okay, free hand, come, join us. But it's a competition with SOE. Competition, it's a competition world. He said market forces allowed to influence the prices. Why not? You can't be only the government control command economy anymore is a mixed economy market forces will play their role and last was why SOEs came up because he gave the incentives incentive for performance you perform better you get government support you don't do better you are kicked away so then the concept he used and these theory worked beautifully for china and the soes kept improving day by day in strength in numbers as well as in the capacity i give example of aircraft carrier somewhere else in defense sector, they have overtaken everybody. Whether it's reverse engineering, whichever way, but they are going much, much faster than anybody because the aim is different. Now, as you mentioned, the book also mentioned about the state funding of SOEs. They have state, the central level SOEs, they have state provincial SOEs, the various levels SOEs controlled, funded. But he mentioned in detail or each how they are funded with a lot of case studies, examples of various uh, SOEs. And he also mentioned how the private, this private partnership model is there, but it is not, in some places, it's not so good. He's criticized in his book, why the PP model is not so good for China. And he, he the whole, in fact, there are five, six pages I mentioned why this Chinese PP model is not so good. Maybe they need more reforms, but he was in China, he don't understand better. Now he comes, he has come to take an example of one case study in his book about one uh, SOE, how, how he revolved around it. He mentioned in one chapter about element of all the SOEs, which SOEs wear whole details about them, of their earning, their work, the quantity, big details are there. What I found more interesting, if you discuss just now, and very news all the time, the BRI, which China took as, as economic statecraft ahead. So BRI came and all the SOE become part of it. So every country has a national interest. Chinese CCP and of course Xi Jinping is the master of all of so-called China, the expansion, he wants to expansion, control the whole world, want to go everywhere. With this theory, with this approach in good, bad, ugly, we leave it there at today. But what he did, he want to go everywhere. He want global expansion. So he planned this and he saw the two routes. That is your Silk Road Economic Belt, SREB, and of course the Maritime Silk Road, MSR, part of BRI. Started from there and he want to go everywhere. You name the country, he's there. But that is the national interest he got. The national interest with a strategic perspective, strategic imperative it has. But he used his SOEs. Now SOEs are competitive because when you're going abroad, you are doing a 
some project there making a building let's say africa making the building for the whole uh, country there is a the question of who is the best contractor or the best company can do it soes are going there i remember my my experience of mozambique in uh, 2002 they made a huge building there for the government but the best part is the soe gave there the first made china town there a china town like a typical chinese you know all those the typical artifacts of china so it makes you feel china is doing for you they make an impression there very nice impression the chinese colony is there and they make the building for you so this is their national interest their strategic uh, framework which they are working on and in the bargain what happened the soe which i involved with them once they got a global coverage they got profits they got capacity building look those those aspect the human capital which they are taking they are taking from china i was amazed to see that that they are doing a work in mozambique but they are using the chinese worker there so employment also remain a factor part of economy they give employment their own people through the soes that concept is not gone because the socialist economy but this soe which are in the bi project now they are using their technical strength which they have in built now over a period they are using their competitiveness i told you because the basic theory of dang which you brought was competitiveness if you are not competitive you will not perform your efficiency will not come then was a high quality service unless you are a high end high quality provider you will not be accepted in the world this is the fact and soes of china actually doing much but much much better than that there are a lot of private players this soes with their private partners have gone a long term partnership now so is a growth is both ways and of course system guarantees because soes have a national guarantee with them so when they guarantee with them they are backed up by the government they have better chance of survival in today's world and of course the team talent when you keep working on this project you are supported by the event your own talent also building up in every event when you make you make a building you make a ship you do some other project you are going to afghanistan you making a bri you are doing sri lanka now making port there how much pool of talent you are developing within your system that is what the point of bri is doing it so the economic craft which is china is developing is through bri is a point to note concern yes as competitors we have a concern for our national interest but you see from the study point of view from the analysis point of view is a point to note how good they have done now i said in china leadership control the ccp and ccp control the life of the people there the basic concept same thing happen soes soes are being used by the ccp to control or all actions incentives and in the process of entrepreneurship they are the tool with the government a tool of the government which they are using it at the strength of the government now the state capital which has come so called red capitalism or a period is being actually pursue the long range objective which china has is going ahead but is balancing is moderation drive so that it balances the socialist ideology at the same time pursuing is that aim of to be great power very soon they are number two economy now they want to take over usa very fast today they are on 15 trillion economy they want to go beyond that they are working towards that and soe are the growth of indian for the, this growth basically now i read this book then i also saw the reforms they have gone for the soe in 1978 to 83 they brought a decentralization from the they have all centralized they got decentralization in 84 to 89 just see a time frame is brought my dr arvin mentioned this around 5 5 6 years gap everywhere so 84 to 89 they made a point that every soe has to make a profit see the see the the carrot and the stick there okay you are you got to make a profit you got to be profit making you can't be a loss making soe or you will be closed you will work and they work and they improve and they start making profit because that works danda work in communist system probably democratic system it doesn't work that's wrong unfortunately in 91 to 2000 they went to the restructuring this was 
a, a golden period for them when they went to restructuring of the whole system of administration as well as monitoring of their performance the quality system through this they call SASAC the full form is state owned asset supervision and admission commission which actually regulates and monitors the whole SOEs is an independent regulator that passes there and they, they check everybody now 2003 when china wanted to go to uh wto 2000 2001 2000 2001 they want to go to wto they want to go to world world your market you want to join the world market you want to join the us so wto came and that's what happened in 2003 when they came up this ssas sasac to ensure that chinese company they're going to wto we follow norms of wto to some extent you always have debates and differences there but this was brought to so the chinese chinese policies chinese soes their product their culture the norms the quality controls are meeting the wto requirements now 2020 2021 chinese soes are the poster child the poster boys of the china's growth everywhere is soes are there you see a sector i think all the sector he explained in his book which i went to the nmnec various sectors everywhere the soes are doing it so they are the one the best doing for the economic growth of china i just read the book and i gave a pause then i start looking at our own system with this book as a parallel being a indian indian economy we have psus again since our independence have we done this way not really we also brought reforms what china brought in 1980 we also brought reforms in 1991 compulsion for us they had their compulsion we had our compulsion we brought the reforms in 1991 economic reforms we also open our economy similar way we got the fdis yes to some extent we say 30% 40% china opened up before because they are one party who can take decision india is a democratic system it is a difference but a communist world one party system or maybe dictatorship as somebody used or a democratic system you got to and that will be a coalition government after that so the very difficult process we, the country went through just yes, we went to reforms psu to make them efficient what the way china went i think that is the way you have to make them competitive if they are not competitive we shut up or give to partners give your private ownership this is what i think government is trying now with this investment process is delayed quite a bit in our system and this correlated with that so gone when you are looking at air india or lot of other psus which need disinvestment and that the private players come become competitors i am sure if that happens our psus some are doing very well ship yards are doing fantastic job hlg fantastic job but there are other psus which are not showing so good they are liability to the government but if you put the reforms in that but china did similar way i am sure we can reach close to china very soon if not so soon very soon so with this i found the book very interesting dr gallery uh, very very interesting because i for the first page to last page i kept putting my uh, flyers very interesting very interesting very interesting the so many so many flyers i could put but uh, when i writing the review was i was controlling myself how much to write so i just controlled myself and i like this book and i refer everybody wants to know how a reforms were carried out in a com communist country keeping the balance of the ideology the political system and the need of the nation to grow it's a very nice book nicely explained we can take a lot of lessons from them when we are pulled we can write a paper on this at komodo basan has asked me now to write a book i definitely want to write a book but i, I promised you sir i will write a write a paper on this how our pc should be reformed keeping this book as a as a ideal to me thank you so much what do you bala thank you sir uh, before i before i begin my uh, talk about dr arvind kalari's book i would like to thank my uh, dg and executive director and also the author of the book dr arvind kalari for this opportunity and uh, uh, quickly just getting into my presentation uh, the book is very systematically uh, arranged first because with lots of uh, painstaking research that has gone into completing all the tables figures and graphs which we can uh, see and uh, quickly i want to take into the history uh, both india and china as we know you know both of them they commenced their journey in a very similar time while right? india commenced its journey in 1947 china commenced its the prc commenced its journey in 
So uh, similar to both the countries, China also had an economy that was very severely uh, disrupted. The socioeconomic conditions were very poor. And during in that time, uh, the, so the SOE, the state-owned enterprises, uh, played a very crucial role because they were also, uh, as mentioned in the book, uh, they served as uh, vehicles uh, that were seen to be given uplift uh, for the existing socioeconomic conditions at that time. And quickly coming back to the present, uh, as we see the Chinese Communist Party, which is celebrating 100 years of its existence today. Uh, today, we are also looking at the story of the China's state-owned enterprises. Uh, you know, I, I would like to divide it into two broad phases uh, after uh, going through reading uh, Dr. Ellery's book. The first phase, I would say, which is in the pre-1978 period, which is pre to the Deng Xiaoping's period. Uh, that was a time we, uh, in the three decades after the founding of the PRC in 1949, where we witnessed uh, establishment of many state-owned enterprises uh, on uh, three important lines, which is the three great socialist reforms, uh, elimination of private property rights, and subsequently what happened was the national industrialization. And the next broader phase of the classification would be the post-1978 when China actually wanted to open up, which is the Deng Xiaoping era, where it was only after the 1978. Uh, why I say mention post-1978 is because it's very crucial because it was only after post-1978, as we read through the book, where we can see that uh, many economic experiments uh, gradually uh, began to uh, being carried out in the state-owned enterprises. And what happened was all these reforms uh, has actually transformed China into a very a large global manufacturing powerhouse uh, with considerable amount of uh, political influence, both it can be uh, internally as well as globally, what we, uh, the China that we see today. Uh, but the situation with the Chinese state-owned enterprises, however, is very, very complex uh, that I, I was able to see going through the book, which Dr. Aravind Ellery has uh, very, uh, you know, he has tried to decipher and bring out all the nuances to its uh, uh, reader. Though the, the title of the book may sound China, Inc. between state capitalism and uh, economic uh, statecraft, I'm sure any uh, layman will be able to get a uh, broader picture, the idea how it has contributed. So just to give you a statistics, as of 2020, uh, what we are able to find is that China is home to more than 100 corporations uh, listed on the uh, Fortune Global 500 companies. But among these, only 15 percentage of those are privately owned. This is also, again, uh, taken from the book. So I would like to uh, quickly take you back to the third phase of uh, reforms of sorts uh, that happens so as to uh, streamline the state-owned enterprises in China. This happened in 2003, uh, where the Chinese government created what we call the State-Owned Assets Supervision and Administrative Commission, the SASAC. So this was a, uh, it was set up, you know, as a key supervisory body in uh, 2003 where we witnessed a shift was happening. Uh, you know, it was seen more as a concentrated, a regulatory power was given to SASAC, and it consolidated all the state assets management of state-owned enterprises. Uh, but importantly, uh, it didn't uh, take into account the financial enterprises and the state banking sector. So which, which I want to take it as an example and explain it to you. Because speaking about the banking sector, China's banking system, you know, it's very, very crucial part of the, uh, the Chinese state-owned enterprises because it is the bank and the interest rate uh, that, defin that defines the relationship between the Chinese state and the state-owned enterprises. Because uh, the, the large state-owned Chinese banks, they, no they are not only part of the uh, Chinese state capitalism, but they also, you know, they are used as a tool to serve the party's objective uh, by way of, you know, steering all the finances to projects that the CCP thinks that these are very important. Uh, what happens is, as a consequence, they cultivate uh, uh, political support and legitimacy for the, the uh, Chinese state. And also what we can uh, see upon reading the book is the state-owned enterprises are frequently you know, used as a mechanism for implementing the policy, uh, providing socioeconomic stability, including building uh, infrastructure, especially the uh, chapters which are dedicated to the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in the book. I would like to uh, quickly bring to the 19th National Congress uh, because that is a present phase where we see a momentum which was continued uh, going by. So what happened in the 19th National Congress was President Xi Jinping pledged to make the state-owned enterprises with three key terms, he said to make it stronger, to make it better, and to make it bigger. So presently, we are witnessing a, a change in geopolitical uh, flux, a change in geo geopolit uh, geopolitical global order. We find the US-China trade war, talks of Cold War 2.0 is happening. And we also see uh, the advent of fourth industrial revolution, uh, where China has taken a, a considerable amount of lead beat in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, internet of things, and everything with, regard, uh, with uh, regard to the science and technology. Uh, in such an environment, what we can see is that China is trying to transform, also China is trying to uh, transform itself uh, from an investment-driven export economy to an innovation-driven economy, uh, which is going to rely more on domestic consumption. So 
in all these putting all these together the role of uh, state owned enterprises has become all more important and what we are uh, said to witness is only it is only said to going to increase so as the book by uh, uh, dr arvind shows the chinese state owned enterprises they have traditionally assisted the government beat in reforms and now it is only said to uh, become even more relevant uh, this is especially particularly more relevant in the strategic sectors uh, where the uh, prc feels that you know the oversight and control is absolutely necessary specifically in defense be it energy telecom aviation including even the railways uh, all these have been brought up you know in a chapter on bri and uh, with these remarks i would like to once again thank dr arvind delary for his uh, excellent book thank you sir with this we would like to move on to the question and answer session there are many questions uh, posted in the chat box i'll take it uh, one by one and uh, dr delary would you like to take it directly or uh, i can read it out for you sir no i think you read it out i think so i think uh, it's better those who are listening on different audios i mean on mobiles and all the things would be able to hear the question thank you sir uh for, i would like to start with my first question what has been the impact of state owned enterprises on china's urbanization and society okay i mean uh, let me first thank uh, discussions you know kamandra garg and uh, bala for being uh, uh, you know taking your time reading the book and please reading it thoroughly and telling me how uh, uh, this book was different uh, i would certainly uh, would like to write to both of you and seek those things in writing so i can improve the book further the second edition or maybe the this, the other part of the edition um, now to move to the question about how soes have contributed to urbanization now one has to understand that SOE is not a new phenomenon. SOE, SOE has an integral, has been an integral part of the Chinese state capitalism, providing iron balls, social security net to Chinese people. Uh, so, if you're working, and if you remember during Mao's time, it was a, uh, it was a pride to work in state enterprises. People used to say that I'm a blue collar, you know, employee. Uh, and those used to have the highest number of you know uh, privileges those used to have the highest number of you know uh, prestige uh, in all, all all in all fashions so soes was that and then they kept the momentum okay and soes played an important role over here but going forward in 1990s when the soes were told to wind up the businesses i mean more than 300000 soes subsidies were told to wind up the businesses and then there was there were you know layouts uh so you can correlate the soes providing the social benefits social security nets to urban population soes which were told to close down which infused the uh, unemployed uh, population in the urban so that is the major uh, those are the major uh, points of worry for the party you know if they have to maintain soes they have to compromise they have to reform if they are reforming in a single shot uh you know uh, 300000 uh, subsidies is closing down that's not a small number i know and uh, and uh, the unemployment uh, number of people who are in employment runs in millions so that's how the one part of it the second part of it the urbanization is not about the people it's about the uh, the urban infrastructure or is about you know how the vertical and horizontal urbanizations went down uh, in 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 the uh, in the uh, in the post reform pr uh, process one has to understand that the soes uh, were the only one i'm sorry you keep hearing me i think i'll just fix that up yes you uh, you're able to hear me well, yeah so uh, on the other hand what happens is that the urbanization when it's carried out reforms and uh, bringing out new industries uh, uh, soes are not only uh looking into industrializations so is we're looking also looking into finances so is we're also looking into the uh administrative uh, sectors so is we're also uh, you know active in the uh, cultural aspects so these so is which were uh, or which survived out of competition uh, turned out to be the one who would uh, control the chinese economy and that helped a new level of urbanization the, the urbanization which is carried out by the present set of soes is all about you know tech tech industries or uh, value added industries so that is adding you know if you can see the greater uh, gray area in shenzhen guangdong uh, uh, and hong kong the urbanization is different than the urbanization which happened in mid 90s or mid 80s 
uh, that is also also uh, mainly because of the way uh, the SOEs are trying to reinvent itself. SOEs are trying to you know uh, trying to uh, find new ways. Uh, you know how they would contribute uh, socially and uh, economically. Is Thank it you, fine sir. Now, Bala? Can yes. I read next question. Yeah. Yes. Next question is by uh, Dr. Bamade from Nepal. Uh, it's a very broad question. I'll just uh, concisely I'll put it. He has asked, how does how did Deng Xiaoping succeed to reform the Chinese economy and polity, uh, putting his economic thought? Well, I think uh, when Deng Xiaoping decided to reform the economy, he did not have any blueprint. You know, what he had at his disposal was the experience he had learned from the for rise and fall of the Eastern European economies, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and, and, and like that. So he did not want to follow them, but he, did, he wanted to follow the capitalist mode of reforms, uh, like opening up. 78 was also not only the thought process were put in forward, okay? I mean, uh, this, the economy was immediately opened. Uh, there were uh, SEZs which were established, and uh, there were a lot of thought went into that. You know, they need not only reform it politically, but reform it more institutionally, structurally, and physically. And that is the reason, you know, there is a logic, you know, why province of Hong Kong was open geographically and not these areas surrounding Beijing. Oh, there is a political reasoning behind it because away from Beijing, Hong Kong felt more confident. Province of Hong Kong or cities uh, or, or like you know Guangzhou felt more confidence to deal with the foreign investments away from the capital Beijing. So you know there was a kind of a confidence which was infused in provinces which were or the pockets which were open for the foreign investments. This was something you know uh, Deng decided to do it and he did it again. This was out of this was non textbook growth. This is not written anywhere that there has to be ABC and through which the reforms has to be carried out. Then later on, if you can see the way the agriculture were privatized yes. and the household responsibility system, that was again a unique case, uh, which was not the experience in the other uh, developing economies. Going forward in late 80s, the China started uh, you know, uh, uh, disintegrating the PBOC, started uh, creating more uh, banks, you know, or, or maybe creating uh, fin other financial institutions. This Deng did it over the period of his learnings from the reform experiences. And he could do it because, you know, he knew that only this is the way to go forward. There was not a single chance Deng found to reverse it. There was no, I mean, whole reform process was irreversible. And as a result of it, Deng has to look only forward. To find ways and to you know maneuver these difficulties, and I think that is the success of uh, Deng's reform processes. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have two questions. The next two questions, you want to uh, one by one, or can I uh, shoot both? I think you can put both. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, first is as a part of uh, reforms in the state-owned enterprises. Nowadays, we find mixed ownership, which is finding mention. Uh, your thoughts on this, and how does it play between the CCP and the private sector? This is my first question. Second, apart from strategic sectors, China's policies in SOEs uh, is many a time seem to be inconsistent with the WTO norms. Your thoughts on this also, sir? Well, the mixed ownership has been introduced by China to somewhere uh, take advantages of the rising private sector. Uh, because the private sector was performing better, but you know, China did not want to give an impression that it is only the private sector which is boosting or working as a thruster for the national economy. So there has to be a balance uh, between between the state enterprises and the private enterprises. And there were areas where the private enterprises were doing beautiful than the state enterprises. State enterprises, despite reforms, lagged in many sectors, many areas. And I think that's where the private sectors were doing great. And the mixed ownership structure was all about where it is possible to work with the private ownership, you know, in, in close consistency. For example, you know, uh, uh, we had uh, this observation on the pollution. Private sector uh, was doing good, you know, in uh, you know in poll you know in pollution control, you know, the technologies, uh, value additions. So is after entering into WTO, if they had to remain into the mainframe of competition, they had to look at the values also, look at the technologies also. They produced it and then they deploy. They could deploy it and they could deploy and they could make themselves more. Uh, uh, you know, uh, stronger 
by working closely with the with the uh, private enterprises. Yeah, and Balan, the second question, can you repeat the second question of yours? Second question is, apart from strategic sectors, China's policies in SOEs are uh, at times seem to be inconsistent with WTO norms. Your thoughts, sir? Well, I, I see that in the initial stages when um, the Israel reforms were carried out, the whole 90s, decade of 90s, I think those reforms and uh, liquidation of SOEs, uh, getting rid of non-performing SOEs were essential and carried out inconsistent with the requirement by the WTO, because China was going to join WTO. But, you know, after this, joining WTO, I mean, well, this is this is my interpretation. After joining WTO, within two to three years, I think that, that's part of my next project, China understood that the promises yes. it was made by the Western countries are, are something, you know, dubious. And the Western countries were trying to exploit the open economy of China because, you know, what happened? Before the WTO uh, uh, negotiations, China sat with EU, China sat with America, China sat with Korea, Japan, and each country tried to steal away the cheese and you know decided okay we this is a list you know 5000 products please delist them we have a 3000 products so it was not only the wto which opened the chinese market but actually these you know discussions between the group of the partner countries of china the trading partner countries which put more force on china to open up its economy and then within two to three years of china entering into the wto and they understood that well uh The Lord is gracious. Lights are back. Well, um, so within two or three years of uh, joining WTO, China understood that, well, I mean, uh, this is not something we, we thought of. Uh, you know, this is uh, surprising. So the SOE's reform, the inconsistencies or consistencies become secondary for the Chinese state. And what became most important for the Chinese state to protect the, the domestic economy. And as a result of it, what the consistency you're referring to it is the product of China joining it, the product of China realizing it, you know, how it should reorient it, reorient its priorities. And that's what you see it. Now, I think I, let me answer that question more, uh, more, uh, more in more details, actually. Uh, then are those inconsistencies not questioning China's role? I mean, uh, in multilateral financial institutions, they do. They do question China's commitment. They do question China's accountability to the multilateral financial institutions and the way the institutions function. Then what happens? Actually, then China tries to comply by some 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 standards, but not all of those standards. And then China has this, you know, uh, uh, cases uh, in WTO where the Chinese, where the Western companies are also found, uh, you know, uh, uh, manipulating some of the standards. Uh, but yes, your your question is quite valid in that context. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, next question is by uh, Ms. Asma. She has asked, uh, "How would you look at uh, SOEs in the mainland forging relations with business or state entities in Hong Kong going forward?" Uh, I think the SOEs have been uh, doing their role. SOEs have been doing. Uh, 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 very well, you know, as far as connecting, controlling its uh, uh, its relations with uh, uh, with the Hong Kong. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Hong Kong question. The question of Hong Kong is quite uh, relevant over here, but the association of SOEs, you know, influencing Hong Kong is not new. That started, you know, early 1990s, 1994-95. You know, after uh, the Hong Kong signed an agreement with uh, with China. The lot of connectivity projects, the bridges, the tunnels, uh, the railway lines, uh, the uh, uh, sharing of uh, airport facilities have been always been, you know, uh, matter of, you know, cream for the Chinese state enterprises. And they are, they're already there. It's not only in 2021 or 2019, 2017 or 2015. They have been doing these things slowly. Well, apart from that connectivity, uh, the the Chinese, uh, the Hong Kong denominations, the Hong Kong dollars are 50% uh, printed by the Bank of China, uh, apart from the Standard Chartered and other bankers. So you know that, you know, in finances and connectivity, China, Chinese SOEs, you know, financial SOEs and industrial SOEs have been always on the forefront to influence Hong Kong. Now, with the mixed economy and with the proposals of PPE, you know, what Chinese are trying to do with Chinese SOEs and public sector undertakings are trying to eye those Hong Kong enterprises 
which uh, which may now which may be the next step. You know, right now, SCMP. You know, if you look at the shares, who owns the SCMP? Uh, Jack Ma. And if you look at the major projects, for example, we had this um, uh, uh, Hainan Airlines. You know, which which bought a lot of chunk of islands, uh, pieces, land masses uh, in Hong Kong. So you know, this is not a new fan. It started with connectivities, then in finances, then in private enterprises. So China has been influencing the way Hong Kong, and now. The Hong Kong economy, the size of the Hong Kong's economy is smaller than Shenzhen. So the, 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 the centrality of Hong Kong is decreasing. The moment the economic centrality of Hong Kong decreases, that means there is more stronger political interventions going to take place. Because now those are not, you know, those political interventions need not to worry about the Hong Kong's contribution to China's national GDP. That has been already on decrease, right? So the important thing, you know, the Chinese, uh, the, the Hong Kong uh, slowing down has helped Chinese enterprises to, you know, bet uh, further to increase their involvement in Hong Kong, to influence Hong Kong. And then also it has given a chance for political leadership to look for chances and involve in Hong Kong, you know, uh, at, at much faster rate. Thank you, sir. Next question is by Dr. Krishnan. He has asked, have the party leaders in China been wise enough to realize the primary importance of economic power through state capitalism, even at the cost of limiting freedom of expression, and careful enough to switch now to common prosperity idea to smoothen the inequalities? Has economic prosperity been at the expense of environmental sustainability? How does the party plan to resolve this? Well, our Chinese leaders would never... Uh popularly call it, they have, they have learned something out of their mistakes. Uh, that, that will never happen. Uh, one has to understand the way party reacts. You know, I mean, that is an indication which one has to derive a meaning out of it. I mean, the way party is functioning, I mean, the question very much a question with regard to mixed ownership, the question very much uh, with regard to the urbanization. And that is how you would get an idea that how party has learned those hard lessons over the period of time and how they are changing the course, uh, its, its, uh, its course. Now, uh, if you hear something about uh, the shared prosperity or uh, uh, well of society, uh, the terms like this, I think there is a more, it has to more with regard to the economic statecraft and less to the state capitalism. State capitalism is something which is within this, within the, within the national boundaries and where the Chinese want to uh, 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 experiment with it. But, you know, these terminologies and these expressions are the term of China dream and, you know, rejuvenations. China has been using it externally to tell its trading partners and everyone to see or to know that what China has developed an economic model of success is feasible and is also uh, uh, can be you know uh, can be copied or can be you know uh, can be uh, can be the source of inspiration. So we should not believe that uh, there has been a U-turn. Or China has been uh, China has learned its, its lessons, and that's why the party has realized it. I think no matter what happens, the party always tries to keep its control on the key levers of the Chinese economy, and I think that is never going to uh, uh, that is never going to disappear in coming uh, uh, decades. I hope I have answered you completely. I'm sorry if not. You can you can just put up the question again. Yes, sir. Uh, next question is by my BG. Amrita Basansar has asked, the recent initiative for common prosperity has brought the stock markets down. And what we will witness is turbulence. Xi would have thought through the process. How do you see this impacting the macro or microeconomics of China? What would be your assessment of global impact of this new thought process? Uh, well, the stock market, uh, I mean, uh... Stock market is not a is not uh, is not something uh, a central pillar of the Chinese economy. If if, if we think so, stock ma stock markets were introduced in 96-97. Uh, it crashed, it rose, and the stock market is not something you know uh, which would really decide you know how the Chinese economy uh, 
would perform, whether it would rise or whether it would fall. For example, you know, 2015, uh, the stock market crisis, uh, it never stopped Chinese. It never uh, influenced or it never inflicted uh, any bad memories on the Chinese economic planners. The stock market, the discussion about the stock market ha can be happened in two different verticals. One vertical is our stock market. Stock market is certainly, you know, when the uh, when the new investments, uh, uh, when the Chinese were looking for new opportunities for investments, capital investments, stock market came quite handy. But then the stock market is not the only one area people should be looking at that is what the Chinese leaders have been indicating to Chinese people. Uh, they have been indicating, they have been telling time and again that, you know, don't over rely it because stock market has been seen as one area, you know, where the Chinese uh, performance were gauged and Chinese were quite apprehensive about it in 2015. You know, after 2015, it took almost one and a half year, two years for Chinese leaders to let its people convince that is nothing has nothing bad has happened. And to let other markets and neighbors and you know world powers believe that you know China is still robust, so somewhere China is trying to get away from those clutches or those standards vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese economies economic performances have been you know uh, tallied. Secondly, uh, uh, the soft, uh, uh, I mean the new terminologies or new control on the economy is causing stock market to slow down. Then, if you compare with my earlier statement. Uh, Chinese do not think that, you know, uh, such economic or ma such micromanagement, if that is stopping uh, the stock market to, to perform, uh, would be any more danger to the Chinese economy. Chinese leaders are not worried about it. So the micromanagement, micro control would continue uh, in the Chinese cases because, I'm, I mean, I've, I, I've been using this term. This term is not institutionalized, so don't take me. Uh, this is non-parliamentary what I want to use it here. The Chinese used to say in Chinese that there is no nonsense, you know, from 2012 onwards. They said Chinese economy is becoming no nonsense anymore. That means that you cannot bribe anyone. You cannot enter anyone. You cannot exit any time. Uh, okay, there were more restrictions, you know, and so that is a reason. You know, Chinese have been doing this, uh, you know, uh, uh, tailoring of its economy for past one decade quite carefully. And this is going to remain or this is going to function until one, one year. Now, I mean, there was one question, I think somewhere uh, Bala was asking about the financial institutions. Let me refer to that again, um, shortly over here. Now, Jack Ma's uh, arrest, not, uh, not arrest, but investigation, because Jack Ma was entering into area where the Chinese SOEs or Chinese state has put its soul, the finances, the wealth of the nation. And if Jack Ma is going to steal that show away from party, the party would lose the word credibility. And that's why he was been told, please get out of the credit business. So what my point is here is this streamlining or this, uh, this you know, I can call this thing, you know, various phases of angioplasty, the Chinese are carrying out on Chinese, you know, uh, blockages, which it has created uh, for, for, for uh, past for four and five decades, where you have pollutions, where you have monopolies, where you have duopolies, you know, Tencent and uh, uh, Alibaba, they are duopolies. Why the Chinese do not see it is a problem. Uh, Alibaba, it is holding most of the, you know, uh, Ministry of Science and Technology, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of uh, Finance. It is the Jack Ma's private company hosts the servers uh, on his uh, company. Interestingly, the name of the company is Alibaba. Baba and Mama. So, you know, you what you would see that it has a greater control and the Chinese do not want, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this combination of Babas and Mamas coming and taking over the limelight away from the party. So I think, Varsan sir, I mean, going forward in next 20 years or 30 years, there will be more control by the party on the, on the economy. Uh, imagine the level of micromanagement the companies are doing or the party is doing. The, the companies have been told to change the AOAs or MOAs and uh, there has to be name of a party. There has to be a member of party uh, in, in, the, in every small board. Even the company is, of, is as small as about half a million uh, remember, uh, with the capital, uh, registered capital. Uh, that is the way the party is doing it. Uh, I, think, I think I'm going too, 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 too long, but I think uh, that is how I can answer you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, you can take on another 10 minutes if uh, Dr. Arvind is okay with that. Yeah, Otherwise, you can terminate at your time. No, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. All right. 
She can take another 10 minutes from you, Dr. Arvind. Yes, sure. Okay, Bala, please wind up at 1910. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is by uh, group captor R.K. Narang, sir. He has asked, uh, I have examined China's UAV program and pillars of its UAV program in my book, India's Quest for UAVs and Challenges. Uh, he, he, he says he learned Chinese and studied the US technology development model and implemented it. He says the challenges lie in convincing Indian stakeholders in steering a similar, similar trajectory because they argue Chinese can do it due to authoritarian rule, not India. Similarly, when argued to follow US approach, it is argued US has enormous money, not India. How do we correct this anomaly and make India move forward? Well, I think that it is not the Chinese model or it is not the US model which should be you know, followed over here. You know, it is all about, you know, you have to have your indigenous way. Because, you know, I, and this I quote from a Chinese ambassador while I was, I was speaking to him, you know, I, I was mentioning to him, you know, how, how India is and how the Chinese economy is. And the ambassador replied to say that every country is different. You know, every economy is different. I mean, being a diplomatic uh, in his selection of words, I think let me use those selection, diplomatic selection of words over here. Uh, we cannot uh, we cannot copy the Chinese model. We neither nor we can copy the U.S. model over here. You know, every economy has its own indigenous uh, features, uh, variables which need to be uh, which need to be followed. Uh, for example, uh, India's growth model is not ABC model. Okay, we have the ACB model. You know, where the services industry is is growing. Now, in that case. How those people who are referring to the Chinese example and U.S. example, and uh, uh, you know, agree with this ACB model? Okay. So my my point of argument over here is there is no uh, you know consistent, there is no standardized way of doing uh, economic uh, progresses or you know selections of your economic priorities. That is absolutely not good. Now, one question, uh, an answer to this question, and also partly an answer to uh, Vasil sir's question about. Uh, you know, are there any top three things we can learn uh, from from China? Okay, which we should be uh, we should be deploying in, in case of India. Uh, before I talk about those three things, one one line of clarification over here is that if anybody wants to learn from China, it is what we should learn is is learn the mistakes. We should not learn the successes because we get, you know, uh, it makes our eyes blind and we say that, look, you know, that model, you know, look that robust growth. And then we do not understand, you know, various pitfalls or whatever, various mischiefs, uh, which, which gets hidden uh, in, the, in the limelight of the successes. So the important formula over here is we should learn from the mistakes. Okay, we should not learn from the success story over here. That's one major thing. Now the three things I think I want to uh, I want to underline over here is the first thing is about how we can perform not better but equal to to the challenges. So the first is about the inefficiencies. We need to try to learn and get rid of the inefficiencies. For example, look at the energy loss we have in transmission. You know nobody can even uh, uh, even guess the transmission loss in India is anywhere between 25 to 30 percent in electricity. You know that transmission loss is huge. Now then you cut about these you know power cuts. Then you cover about you know lack of critical infrastructure in India for the industries. You know if you work around these inefficiencies, if you work around these you know areas, you would better be you will be able to use uh, the present infrastructure, critical infrastructure to. To help your economy grow further, this is not only about the electric transmission. This is same as as for as the other energy resources are concerned. So efficiency is quite important and integral part of economic success. Second thing is about who are the torch bearers of uh, the Chinese economies. Uh, apart from the SOEs, yes, SOEs did because I think SOEs had the blessing of state council, but the smaller a medium, the micro, small, and uh, medium scale enterprises. These enterprises are very important. You know, if you just tally the share of these MSMEs in China's employment generation, if you just tally the MSMEs share in exports, if you tally MSMEs share in innovation, you will understand that what we are missing. That's that's a major point of learning for all of us. Okay, and the last one is the accessibility, accessibility to the market. Despite you conserve your energy, despite you uh, you sort of try to uh, 
uh, bring efficiency, even if you try to make your MSME, um, uh, give them credits, okay, or uh, uh, lure them with, you know, some, you know, capital infusion. The important thing, important bottleneck, all these two things would stop at is an accessibility. I mean, one can talk about, I don't know whether this is a good forum or not, the, the, the farmers in India and the farmers in China, and if you look at their access to market, okay, in China and in India, you would find a huge difference. MSMEs in India, their access to market or their access to the export uh, sectors limited with regard to China. So I think if these three th things are considered positively, there are chances where we can build on. And I think partly uh, if I would have answered the question to uh, uh, Krishna's question uh, and also partly to Vasan's question. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by Mr. Subramaniam Shetran, sir. He has asked, are the so-called private enterprises in China truly private? I asked this question in the light of the revelations in case of the Huawei, a so-called private company where the founder was owned a mere one person and the rest was owned by an entity called Trade Union Committee. Your, your thoughts on this, please, Dr. Indian. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I mentioned about uh, the various state capitalism, you know, state capitalism in Indonesia, India, or in Russia, or in Thailand, uh, in Russia, or in China. Uh, there is a growing in intervention of state in market forces, how the market forces should act and where there has to be control over the market forces. Now in China, we cannot make an excuse and say that China is, you know, a divinely state which will not do what the other states are doing. It, be it becomes quite natural in China that that intervention is quite explicit. If I answer your question uh, in a bullet point, how private the private enterprises in China, the private enterprises in China are only private on the paper uh, because they are registered uh, the limited liability uh, companies and so. But in actual, they're not private because at one point or the other, the suppliers, the networks of the productions or the other networks of market access pass through these SOE or PSU controlled domains. And then that's the point where the private enterprises have to do some swapping or, you know, give and take. And that's the result of it. Those, those, those are not no more private. But you may say that Oh, well, that is only the functional part of it. Uh, but I was, you may say that, you know, my question was that in technical terms, you know, uh, are private uh, enterprises independent? If you look at the, the compulsions, you know, or this give and take, the private sector has to do with the state that limits the freedom and independence of private enterprises, one. Secondly, the credits, the private enterprises, private enterprises are private enterprises. They may need credit as big as about uh, a billion RMP or two billion RMP. And they do not have the, uh, you know, uh, 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 they do not have the enough balance. So they have to go to the credit uh, businesses or institutions. So those are controlled by the state. Now the state intervention comes there as well. Well, forget, suppose if there is a company called Alibaba, Okay, which does not need a credit, you know, which can go to stock listing and create its own uh, 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 funds, or maybe it can start a new vertical because it has enough capital. Okay, or maybe it is working into a niche area where the state and enterprises are not there. Now, now the, your question. Let me take your question again. Now there are no, you know, uh, you know, uh, running through or you know, eating up the space of state and enterprises, or there is no capital needed from the credit businesses. Then, Dr. Arvind are the private businesses private. Now, still the private businesses are not private here because, again, the reference with the constitution change in the constitution, where the constitution of stipulates every private enterprises to have certain lines mentioning that, you know, they will listen to the party guidelines. There is a party representations. Alibaba did it. A lot of companies in Chochiang, a lot of companies in Pongzhou, they did it. So on this, all these three premises, you would see that the Chinese companies are not private companies are not or cannot function as a private enterprises. These are certain, you know, limitations they face. Thank you very much, sir, for patiently taking all our questions. I think we have come to the 
end of the Q&A session. May I now request uh, Executive Director Commodore uh, Vijesh Garth to present the concluding remarks and vote of thanks. Uh, sir, could you please unmute yourself, sir? Thank you so much. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Arvind Yeleri for a, presenting such a lovely book to read and learn. And what comes out today's talk in his presentation, taking the question through the question answers, Bala gave, DG gave some talks came to us. What the point came from here? One was China is going with, as per Chinese national interest, their plan, their reform started in 1978 with a political will, which is required. If the political will is strong, being a communist, being a dictatorship, one party rule, they can do assertive much more than a democratic country. And they did it. They're looking at the ruthless. As it came in during talks, they are absolutely ruthless. You're not listening to us, you are crushed. But we are going ahead, not looking back, which is not possible in democracy. This book of his one and a half years of project work, which he mentioned, has brought out a lot of aspects which came during questions and got answered beautifully. And what he said, what is required is first is efficiency, which Chinese reforms have brought out in the SOE. Efficiency. What he said, if you have to learn, then learn from mistakes, what they have made. We don't make same mistake. We are looking at success, yes, but look at the mistakes which they made. We don't let not make the same mistake again. Importance of MSMEs. Yes, it is China, it's India, same story. MSMEs are part of our growth, major growth engines, and they give huge employment, and China is encashing them beautifully, so we are trying to catch them. The one part which uh, the question came to the ask, and then the last very interesting question came, what is private sector in China? The truth came out now. There's actually nothing private there. Private on paper, otherwise public. And smartly they do it. And this is what actually happening. BRI, which I mentioned, so-called economic craft, that China is going across the world doing BRI or whatever project they're doing it. But actually they are SOEs in the garb of so-called private chaps. This is what the true story is. So this books, book is beautiful. The discussion have been very, very learning for all of us. What China is doing, how China is growing, what is the truth and what is, how strong has been the political will. The question Narang had asked, what India can do? Well, options are many. First thing, the political will. In a democracy, the political is the biggest question. We are saying, Aap Nirbar Bharat, we are working towards that. But how much we have put the assertiveness on our PSUs, or whosoever is doing it, or private sector to do it, is the question today. That is the only answer can be given at this juncture. Thank you, Dr. Larry, so much, generally, so much for being with us. I'd like to thank Komodo Vasan. Thank for you. forcing me to go through this book, review and conduct this session because it's a very interesting subject for all of us who are China watchers to learn like this from this topic, such books, beautiful books. And we look for a second edition which is coming up. We like to take it around here. I'd like to thank all the participants in this forum and all my colleagues from C3S for organizing this beautiful discussion. Thank you so much. Jai Hind.